Well, greetings this morning, in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, and soon coming King. It's good to be here. Um, why don't we start by standing for a word of prayer before we begin. Lord, we bow before you. Because you are God, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised, loved, followed, exalted, lived for. And we just want to commit our lives to you again this morning and say thank you that we can serve you and be part of your kingdom. You are good. Thank you for your love towards us. Pray that you would bless this next hour and that you would use my lips to edify and bless your church. Pray that you administer to each of us. I pray that I would be able to lift up and exalt your name to, to where it needs to be. Just pray that you would bless this time, bless the ears. Just be amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> So four months ago, I, I started a series titled Journey into Jesus. That was, I think, in September. <clears throat> A journey into our Lord, Savior, and soon coming King. A journey into God, the Son. A journey into the man, Christ Jesus. I want to continue this journey this morning. But before we continue, I said some things in that first message uh, that may not have been completely doctrinally sound. Uh, concerning the Trinity, I was treading pretty close to the Jesus-only doctrine, which apparently is a thing. And uh, some people came to me afterwards and uh, corrected me on that, so I thank you for that. I guess that is just one example of why we need each other in the body of Christ. So I do apologize for that, that uh, I was treading a little bit close to something that may have been doctrinally off. I just wanted to say that before we continue. Also, my ma last message that I preached two months ago on the whole Middle East thing, that's how I started. I had a genealogy thing here. There was some stuff in that genealogy that also wasn't 100% accurate. I will fix that some other time. But some of you, after that message, uh, also asked me about it. Uh, there were some uh, ages that were wrong and some very interesting thing in that genealogy that I, I do want to fix at some point, maybe when I continue on the same subject matter. So I just wanted to also say that. <clears throat> okay, journey into Jesus. So a journey into the person of Christ is indeed an endless journey full of wonders. He is the central theme of Scripture. More books have been written about him than all other people in history combined. Innumerable sermons have been preached about him. There's still room for more. Innumerable songs have been written about him in thousands of tongues and are sung by millions of people around the world every day. In his book, Journey into Jesus, John Kobelentz says, asks this question, How shall we think about the one who came from heaven to earth, live among us for 30-some years, astound the whole region with his miracles, taught much that is counterintuitive to us, died a criminal's debt, appeared to his followers after rising from the dead, and commissioned and inspired them to spread his story all over the world. He continues and says, One way to think about Jesus is to consider the many names given to him. Names given prophetically. Names given by angels, messengers, Names given by his followers, 
Names given through special revelations and even names given by his scoffers. One of my desires for this series is to take a closer look at some of the names given to our Lord that we might not be too familiar with. Jesus the Messiah, what does that even mean? What did it mean 2,000 years ago? Jesus, the root and offspring of David. Huh? What's that supposed to mean? And does it have any significance today? Lion of the tribe of Judah. What? Is that even relevant in 2024? And why a lion? And not some other, not some other animal. <clears throat> So these titles just mean, did these titles just mean something 2,000 years ago, or are they still relevant today? So that is just a small sample of some titles that I want to take a deep dive into, Lord willing, in the future. <clears throat> so this morning, I want to look at one of the names or titles of Jesus that appear that appears 81 times in the Gospels. According to the Gospels, this is the title that Christ used most often for himself during his earthly ministry. And it seems to have been his title of choice. What was it? Son of man? Is that correct? Everybody agree with that? 81 times, that is correct. So the title of today's message is Journey into Jesus, the Son of Man. In fact, the title Son of God is used less than half as many times as the title Son of Man. 31 times Son of God is found in the Gospels, 81 times Son of man is found in the Gospels. Why the emphasis? Does this title have a deeper meaning than we might realize? I don't know what you immediately think of when you hear the term son of man. Perhaps you think, sounds boring, sounds mundane or ho-hum. Or you might think, well, it just means he was human. Some of the names or titles given to Jesus have more meaning to them than meets the eye. Some require you to do some digging to get the full depth and full meaning. And as we go through this series, series we will attempt to do just that. The title Son of Man is one of those titles that require a bit more digging to get the full benefits, the full rewards. So we will, by God's grace, do that this morning. We sometimes forget that the Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The titles given to our Lord while here on earth, or given by prophets centuries before, or given by angels, those titles still apply today. If they do not, we're in trouble. Or if only some do, then how do we decide which ones do and which ones don't? Some examples. The title Lamb of God appears in John two times in the Gospel of John. It only appears uh, three times in the entire New Testament, believe it or not, the term Lamb of God. In John 1, 29, the next day John see Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. A few verses later, and looking unto Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And Peter alludes to that as well in 1 Peter, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. But the term Lamb of God only appears two times, actually, in the New Testament. <clears throat> the term bread of life is also only found in the Gospel of John. 
and was given by Jesus himself. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The title, Our High Priest, appears only in Hebrews. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's our high priest found in Hebrew. The title, The Good Shepherd, appears only in John. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. The resurrection, the title, the resurrection, appears only in John. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The title, Our Captain, appears in Hebrews. And the term is also used by Peter in Acts. But he uses the word prince. And if you dig into that word prince, it means author or captain or chief leader. The title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords appears in Timothy and Revelation. First Timothy, which in his time he shall shew who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation, and these shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called the chosen and faithful. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Appears three times in the New Testament, that title. The title Lion of the tribe of Judah appears only in Revelation, but originates all the way back in Genesis. That verse in Revelation says, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. This is one of the titles that I really, really look forward to diving deep into the future. <clears throat> there is so much there. <clears throat> Another title. Root and offspring of David appears only in Revelation, but originates with the Davidic covenant that God made with King David. The verse in Revelation says, Jesus speaking, I have sent mine angel to testify unto, the, unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. What does that mean? I also look forward to diving into that one deeper in the future. So those two, Lion, Tribe of Judah, and Ruth, and Offspring of David, there is so much there. <clears throat> like I said, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We cannot take just some of his names, titles, and leave others. It's not that some of his names are relevant and some are outdated. They are all relevant. Like I said before, if they are not, how would one decide which ones are and which ones aren't? <clears throat> you can't say, oh, I like, you can't say, oh, I like Lamb of God, but I don't like Lion of the tribe of Judah. I don't think that's relevant or even applicable and in this day and age, it sounds a bit racist. <clears throat> Sorry, you can't pick and choose. He is all of them. He is all of them. Now, I believe that some of them will find their complete fullness, yet in the future, 
We have a shadow of them now, but I think some of them will find their complete fullness and their complete fulfillment in the future, such as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, he is that now, but the ultimate, the, the fullest version of that, I think, is still to come. And even the line of the tribe of Judah is something that I consider to be the, full, the, full, the fullness of that is uh, futuristic. <clears throat> Both of them are found in Revelation and will find their complete fulfillment when those future events take place. <clears throat> um, that doesn't mean he's not that now. <clears throat> so please don't un misunderstand me. Okay, back to our topic, Son of Man. The title Son of Man is significant in Christian theology, and the term is found frequently in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, where Jesus uses it to refer to himself. The significance of Jesus being called the Son of Man can be understood in several ways. First, it emphasizes and highlights his humanity. By calling himself the Son of Man, Jesus highlights and emphasizes that he is fully human. Not half, fully. He is fully human, identifying with humanity in its joys, in its sorrows, and its struggles. This contrasts with other titles like Son of God, which highlight his divine nature. As the Son of Man, he is one of us. He is fully human. Sharing in our humanity is an important component of the redemption story. Typical of Jesus' humility, this title was his title of choice. Like I said, 81 times in the Gospels, the term Son of Man is used. 31 times in the book of Matthew alone. It would take a long time to go through all the references, but here are a few. We will look at a few of them. <clears throat> Matthew 8 and verse 20. And Jesus saith unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air, they have their nests. But the Son of Man hath not, nowhere to lay his head. Isn't that something? The Son of Man identified as homeless. Jesus was intentionally poor. Some of us might feel poor at some time because of circumstances or jobs not turning out or who knows. We might feel poor sometimes, but that's not intentionally. Jesus was intentionally poor. He was needy. He was dependent on others. He was intentionally wounded. He was untraveled. Some of us like traveling. I love to travel. I love to travel the world. Jesus, the Son of Man, came to earth 2,000 years ago and stayed in an area, what, 100 miles by 50? He was untraveled. He was on everything we think we must be to be somebody. He did this to demonstrate the essence of true humanity. He was intentional about it. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Have you ever in your lifetime, felt rejected. The Son of Man can identify with you. Have you ever felt rejected by family members? The Son of Man can identify with you. The Gospels tell us that not even his siblings believed in him. He was despised. He was rejected. If you have ever felt despised or rejected, the Son of Man says this morning, I understand. 
The sorrows of humanity found their place in his experience. He knew what it meant to be hunger, to be hungry, to be thirsty. He had physical pain. I like to think that in the carpenter shop, he perhaps got a splinter or hit his thumb a time or two. It hurt. He probably put it into his mouth, just like we would, and looked at it. He had physical pain, poverty. He was falsely accused. He was rejected, betrayed. He had temptations, mockery, faced with hard and difficult questions. The Son of Man can identify with you. He was misunderstood, criticized, was given overwhelming assignments. Have you ever been misunderstood? Have you ever been criticized? Have you ever been giving overwhelming assignments? Have you ever faced temptation, betrayal, false accusation? The Son of Man this morning says, I understand. The Son of Man can identify with you. <clears throat> something as, I uh, don't know the word, but even something like singleness, we can struggle with that. The Son of Man can identify with you. Childlessness, the Son of Man can identify with you. Difficult relationships, shame, sickness, I don't know, we don't have any record that the Lord ever had a fever or had a headache. I like to think that if a flu came around, I like to think that he experienced it as well. He took on flesh. He wanted to experience life as a human. He took it all. <clears throat> People wanting to use him for their selfish ambitions. Have you ever felt that way? The Son of Man can identify with you. Going through the death of a loved one, Jesus, the Son of Man, can identify with you. He loved Lazarus. When he was in front of the tomb, Jesus wept. Um, another thing that I thought of, Joseph, his stepfather, I guess, likely died between when Jesus was 12 and between Jesus at the temple. That was, that's our last, uh, our last reference to Joseph. So people think that he likely died when Jesus was between 12 and 33 years old, or 30 years old when he started his ministry because he is no longer mentioned. So he likely died. Think of that. The teenager Jesus, or the adolescence Jesus, <clears throat> partaking in a funeral of his own loved one. <clears throat> Jesus, the Son of Man, has been there. He, whatever you are facing, whatever you are going through, he says this morning, I understand. Down through the ages, distressed and persecuted believers broken by sorrow, bloodied by persecution, have found immeasurable comfort knowing that Jesus, the Son of Man, understands completely. He understands completely. Jesus, the Son of Man, was born of a woman, just like all of us. He went through a fragile infancy, just like us. He went through a childhood with its wonder and curiosity, just like us. Through adolescence, just like us. He ate and drank what they ate and drank in those days. He had delights, he had joys, and he had sorrows, just like us. The Son of Man understands what it is like to live in a broken world. He was tempted and tried. 
He was poor and despised. He was beaten and betrayed. He suffered all the sorrows and disappointments of human experience. Even now, restored to divine glory, he bears the scars of his suffering. He bears the scars of his suffering. A reminder to all of us that he has been there and he has done that. <clears throat> Another significance of Jesus being called the Son of Man was to highlight his role as a suffering servant. Mark tells us the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. In Luke, he asks this question, For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth? The answer is, he that sitteth at meat. But then he says, but I am among you as he that serveth. The Son of Man. This highlights his role as a suffering <clears throat> servant. So the term Son of Man also emphasizes Jesus' sacrificial mission and his willingness to suffer on behalf of humanity. His willingness to suffer on behalf of humanity. Okay, as we continue, <clears throat> another significance of Jesus being called the Son of Man finds its origin in the book of Daniel, and it is perhaps the least familiar to us. You can turn there if you want. I think you should. These are incredible verses. Daniel 7 and verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> These are glorious verses. <clears throat> Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. It is my belief that this is the coronation of King Jesus. He's coming in the clouds. Uh of heaven and came to the ancient of days. I believe that's God the Father. They brought him near before him. I don't know who the they are. Maybe it's all of us. Maybe it's all the saints. Maybe it's the angels. They brought him to the ancient of days. He is coronated as king. I don't know if I'm saying that right. The next verse. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. In the book of Revelation, this verse is quoted again. Revelation is drawing from what Daniel has in, in his, in his uh, writings. So Revelation 14, 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. This is the same event. And both of these portions of Scripture, in Daniel and in Revelation, they call him the Son of Man. <clears throat> this is none other than the Lord Jesus himself. None other, in Daniel and in Revelation, none other than the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus himself. <clears throat> the term Son of Man received its messianic connotations directly from this Daniel passage. I will say that again. The term Son of Man, when Jesus used it, received its messianic connotations directly from from the passage in Daniel. The Jewish people were waiting and anticipating the Messiah to show up. And one day, this man appears, a carpenter's son, and starts referring to himself as the Son of Man. 
his Jewish audience, which is very familiar with the Old Testament prophets. They say, wait a minute. Is he saying that he is the Son of Man in Daniel? But in Daniel, he comes in the clouds and is given dominion and is given glory and is given a kingdom. So what's this? Who is this? Is this not the carpenter's son? But he's healing people. He's raising people from the dead. He speaks to nature and it obeys. Jesus, in summary, was a real head-scratcher to the general public of that time. They were expecting something, a certain something, and when he came, it wasn't like what they were expecting. They were expecting clouds and glory and kingdom and trumpets and who knows what else, and that didn't come. But yet, he is showing his divine authority over things. He's speaking to people. He's raising people from the dead. He's speaking to nature. So he was, to the general public, a, a, a head-scratcher. He, he was a head-scratcher. I'll just uh, phrase it that way. <clears throat> they didn't know what, what to do with him. So by using the term son of man, he emphasized his humanity and caused the minds of his listeners to go to the book of Daniel, the prophet. That's where the saying originated from. So by calling himself that, he forced his listeners' minds to go back to the book of Daniel, the prophet, and perhaps causing many to ask, many of them to ask, is this son of man and the one in Daniel the same person? <clears throat> his divine authority that he showcased throughout his ministry proved his divinity, which in essence made the statement that the son of man this messianic figure in Daniel is me. That's what he was, that's in essence what he was saying. By, by, I've said it before that if, if Jesus wouldn't have had the signs and wonders backing him up, no one ever would have believed him. It was, it was those things. He had authority over demons. He had authority over the kingdom of darkness. He had authority over nature over dead people. It was that that caused people to say, this is not an ordinary human being. There's something going on. The conflict was their preconceived ideas didn't match what, they, what was in front of them. <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, Jesus perhaps did it on purpose, used the term on purpose, to, to force his audience to go to Daniel and to try, and uh, uh, it, it forced them in their minds to go to the to book of Daniel and ask, is this messianic figure in Daniel, and this, what we have here now, is that the same person? <clears throat> but there's an interesting uh, passage I want to look at. Luke 5, if you want to turn there... <clears throat> Luke 5, verse 17. This is an interesting uh, situation that happened here. Luke 5, 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was watch teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with, which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in, in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by that way, by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power, there's that phrase, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he arose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. <clears throat> we have seen strange things today. In Mark it says, we, have never, we never saw it on this fashion. So let's take a deeper look into these verses. So here we have a situation where a paralyzed man Mark tells us, was carried by four people on a stretcher. The crowd was so thick, they couldn't get in. There was no access. So they saw a stairway going to the roof, which they then took, and being a flat roof, likely, they started disassembling the roof so that they could have access to Jesus straight down. <clears throat> So there was probably a commotion and noise and dust and all that. <clears throat> so they let this man down right in front of Jesus. Jesus, seeing all this, these people are desperate. They're taking the roof apart so that they can have access to me. This is a rather remarkable situation. <clears throat> Jesus says simply, man, your sins are forgiven you. Of all the things he could have said, he said this. Why did he say, man, your sins are forgiven you? Because it was a setup. He was setting up the Pharisees for a trap. Uh, doesn't sound very nice, but that's what's going on here. He was setting them up. This saying is what got the Pharisees' attention. And he said, and they said, what for blasphemies are these? Who can forgive sins but God? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, challenged them immediately. That right there should have shown them that this is not an ordinary human being, as Jesus read their thoughts, as he did in other situations as well. But it's about to get better. The Lord often rebuked the Pharisees just by asking them a question in somewhat of a riddle-like form. So that's what's going on here. So he asks them, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or to say, rise up and walk? So I will also ask you this question. What is easier to say? It's important to get this right, because if we get it wrong, we will not properly understand these verses and what is going on. So what is easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or rise up and up. Just at face value. Don't dig deep. Just at face value, right there, what is easier to say? Thy sins are forgiven you, or rise up and walk. Your sins are forgiven. That's easier to say? Okay. Okay. Any other, any other opinions? Shh. Okay, yes, you're right. You're right. It's easier to say, thy sins are forgiven you, because you don't see the evidence of that. The man isn't immediately clothed in white or a halo above his head. You don't see the evidence of that. But to say rise up and walk is next level. So in other words, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you don't see the evidence of that. 
To say, rise up and walk is next level. I just said that. So after he asked the Pharisees the question, they would have in their minds said, it's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, than to say, rise up and walk. They never answer him. But Jesus knows their thoughts. They never answer him. Perhaps they are sensing that this is a setup, that this is a trap. So, thy sins are forgiven thee. <clears throat> Um, so in their mind, so after the Pharisees are asked, they in their mind, they say, uh, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven than to rise up and walk. Jesus then, knowing that they concluded this in their mind, then said, but that you may know that the Son of Man had power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palace, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch or thy bed, and go into thine house. And he immediately did that. The point is this. If he can say, if he can do that which is seemingly harder, to say rise up and walk is seemingly harder. There's evidence for that. A crippled man then gets up a paralyzed man and walks. You don't see the evidence of sins forgiven. So if he can say to a crippled man, rise up and walk, that which seems harder, he is then also to do that which is, seems easier. So do you get that? If he can do that which is seemingly harder, he could, do, he could also do that which seemed easier. This whole passage here is dripping and saturated with the deity of the Son of Man. From knowing their thoughts, to forgiving sins, to healing the man. Only one person on earth ever could do all three of these. <clears throat> Only one person. Rise up and walk, thy sins are forgiven thee. <clears throat> so if he could do the harder, he could also do the easier. This is none other, none other than the Son of Man spoken of by Daniel the prophet. None other. When Jesus was on trial, getting close to the end here, <clears throat> when Jesus was on trial, turn to Matthew 26. This is also an interesting portion here. <clears throat> Matthew 26, and I will read... From 59, Jesus on trial. Now the chief priests and elders and all, all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. What a silly, silly accusation. Why, why were there no witnesses that came and said, this man says he forgives sins? This is just, it's just weird. <clears throat> so these false witnesses came. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. This irritated the high priest. And the high priest answered and said unto them, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, this now forced Jesus to answer, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He had spoken blasphemy. What further need have we any more of witnesses? Behold, now we have heard his blasphemy. So the high priest asked Jesus if he was the Son of God. Jesus' response is remarkable, and most people don't make this connection. But he is literally quoting from the book of Daniel. 
We read those verses in Daniel already, but here it is again. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Jesus on trial here is quoting Daniel. So Jesus is asked whether he is the Son of God, and he takes the high priest back to the book of Daniel and admits that he is indeed the one that Daniel wrote about. This is simply too much for the high priest to absorb. He starts tearing his clothes and labels it as blasphemy. So the high priest was saying, did you all hear what he just said? He is saying that he's the one in Daniel, the one coming with the clouds of heaven. This is absurdity. We know where he's from. We know who his parents are. We know who his siblings are. Is this not the carpenter's son? Did you all hear what he just said? He quoted from our beloved prophet Daniel, saying that he is the Son of Man coming with clouds. This brought down the death penalty. They accused him of blasphemy, that he has the audacity to identify himself with that Son of Man in Daniel, and it brought the death penalty. <clears throat> so, at face value, when we read the term, Son of Man, we likely have just assumed it meant that Jesus was a man. It does indeed mean that. But in the prophetic Jewish context at the time of Christ, it meant more than that. It meant much more than that. <clears throat> And now that we have analyzed it and looked at the prophetic messianic relevance of the term and where it originated from, we should see that there is more to the term son of man than we have perhaps known or realized. So in summary, the title son of man encapsulates it encapsulates the dual nature of Jesus as fully human and fully divine. The fulfillment of messianic prophecies, the suffering servant, and the future judge of humanity. The term Son of Man provides a rich theological understanding of Jesus' identity and mission. <clears throat> so, what for references do we have of Jesus, the Son of Man, after the resurrection? Are there any references to him are there any there are there any given are there any other times after the resurrection where jesus is called the son of man i ask this because we might be tempted to think that the term was only relevant before he had resurrected before he had a resurrected glorified body and that would be a false assumption in acts when stephen was stoned to death it says, he looked up into heaven. Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. In the book of Revelation, once he is, only once in the entire book of Revelation is he referred to as Son of God and twice he is referred to as Son of Man. <clears throat> These verses are here. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Revelation 14, 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, li one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. <clears throat> I think I read that verse already. This blesses me tremendously. In Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the resurrected, glorified, coming again Christ is once again titled Son of Man. To me, that is significant. He still wants to identify with humanity. He wants to identify with the sons of men. This is incredible. The glorified, resurrected, coming again Christ is 
once again referred to as the Son of Man. <clears throat> he wants to identify with us. What a Savior. <clears throat> In 2024, Jesus is still the Son of Man. For us to title him as such is not wrong, it's not outdated, and it is not unbiblical. The Lord does not mind that title. He does not mind that title, the Son of Man. In closing, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, has trod the world. The trace of the divine footsteps will never be obliterated. And the divine footsteps were the footsteps of one who is man. The example of Christ is such as men can follow until mankind wears his image towards yonder summit on which stands not an angel, not a disembodied spirit, not an abstract of ideal and unattainable virtues, but the man Christ Jesus. He is our man. He is our man. He is our captain. He is our leader, our redeemer. He's our elder brother forever. Is he your man this morning? Is he your man this morning? Is he your captain this morning? Is he your leader? Is he your redeemer? Is he your elder brother this morning? Jesus, the Son of Man, O come, let us adore him.